Housemasters, the hard knock school of everything new construction and remodeling, powered by Home Projects. Now introducing the Home Projects Housemasters, Steve and John with Homeowner Contracts 101, understanding the complexity of construction contracts and how contractors leverage your ignorance. Welcome to House Masters, presented by Home Projects. I'm Steve, and as always, I'm joined by my colleague, John. Before we begin, we ask that you please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit like, and even hit the little bell at the bottom to get push notifications when we publish new content. While this is intended to be an organic discussion with you, we please ask that you leave comments or leave notes on our socials if you have any questions or ideas for future episodes. And of course, please share this video and our podcast in your socials to help get this information out to everyone who needs it. If you're listening on a podcast, please follow the, follow the show and give us a five-star rating. A review would be awesome as well. All videos, podcasts can be found on our website and on our YouTube channel and wherever you listen to podcasts. So we're pretty much everywhere. We also ask that you make a donation to our cause. Without your generous support, we'll not be able to continue with this educational platform that you will be enjoying over the coming months and years. So John, we've gathered here this evening to talk about contracts. And we are talking about contracts with homeowners or clients, um, which is a little unique. I think um, most homeowners probably are not going to hear what we're about ready to tell them. Uh, especially not the way that I've organized it and have, have decided to present it. So to all the homeowners out there, um, I'm going to go over um, some very basic high-level information first, almost like a vocabulary lesson of some of the major elements of a contract. And, uh, and then I'm going to go into great detail about four specific contracts that I see every day in my professional career as a architect, project manager, and um, owner's representative. And so everything I'm getting ready to tell you and, and what John will be commenting on is a result of us learning the hard way. Um, as both contractors, so we're giving you an inside line here, so to speak, we're showing you how the magic is made, how the, the sausage is made. Um, but also as homeowners, both John and I own homes, and even though we both are in the construction industry, we hire contractors all the time to do work for us in our personal homes. And so um, come at this from both sides. John, anything you want to say to homeowners before I dive into this? Yeah. Um, I want the homeowners that are actually viewing this episode to um, remember one thing. Uh, obviously, we're coming at this like you said, from being contractors, but we're also homeowners. The contract, whichever form that you determine is best for your particular project, is the best example of communication that could be included in the process. Because for one, it's going to lay out what is going to be done during the project and what's not going to be done during the project. And if the details are not laid out to your needs and wants, mm -hmm. that should tell you a lot about as to whether you should hire that particular contractor or not. Um, it's extremely important for your protection as a homeowner, just like we've talked in previous episodes in regards to, to permits. The permit isn't for the protection of the contractor. It's for the protection of you as a homeowner, okay? The safety of your home, the longevity of your home, the health of your home, so on and so forth. This contract, look at this contract as a means to the elongation of that health, longevity, and structure of the home. To make sure that it, everything's being done properly and to the specifications that you're requesting to be done. So um, just take that into account when you're listening to these uh, particular uh, scenarios that Steve's going to be sharing. And uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail uh, later in the episode. Yeah, that's good comments. 
<clears throat> yeah, so before I do get started here, um, just a little hint, a little, um, pro little um, behind the scenes hint. We did this episode uh, for the contractors also. Um, and so a lot of the information I'm going to present to you now from the homeowner side of view, we also told the contractors. And the beauty of what we are doing here is that you can go over to that portal and listen to that video and hear exactly what we advise the contractors to do when they're dealing with you. I think it's important that you know where they're coming from. And I expect they'll probably come over and watch this video too, although we didn't invite them to do that. Um, I think it's important for both sides to understand the point of view from both sides. And just like John said, it's about communication. You're hiring a contractor for their reputation and their and their your ability to get along with them, not necessarily, um, you know, their their cost or their fee or their profit. Always always hire somebody that you 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 know you're going to spend some time with. So anyway, before we get it, you know, we're going to jump into this pretty quick. So, why as a homeowner should you insist on a contract? You should insist on a contract because contracts provide um, a written documentation of what you expect from your contractor. And just like John said, it's about establishing communication. You're going to define the scope of work. When I say scope, that's what you're doing. How big is it? Um, what's in it? What color is it? You're going to be determining the price. And you're going to be determining the schedule, the holy grail, the, th the, the tripod of all things that go wrong in a construction project, scope, price, and schedule. And then last, you're going to determine how you deal with and agree on changes to those three things, because there will be changes in scope, there will be changes in price, and there will be changes in schedule. If I can guarantee you anything in a project is that those three things will happen. If they don't, then I need to meet that contractor because I've never, as a contractor myself, I've never had, never had a project not have changes. Okay. One of the more, other more important things aside from scope, price and schedule that you have to determine in a contract, and this is for your, your benefit as well as the contractors yeah. is how you deal with conflict resolution. You wake up one morning and the contractor shows up and you're just not digging it anymore. Now, obviously, you have to have a really good reason to want to to um, end a contract. But how do you deal with that level of conflict? And the three main reason, three ways of doing it are through mediation, arbitration, and litigation. I'm not a lawyer. John's not a lawyer. We're not going to go into the pros and cons of those three. I deal with them every day as a as a uh, project manager and an owner's rep. I do understand all three of them. Um, and there's subtle differences between the three, but you want to define one. You want to pick one, or maybe you have all three in your contract and you list them in the order in which you may have to go through them if things really go south on you. But that's really important for you to have that in your contract so that if something goes wrong, you can say to the contractor, I'll see you in court and mean it. He can't come back and say, no, 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 we're really just going to, we're going to arbitrate this. No, no, no. I'll see you in court and mean it. There is a handful of things that every contract provides that you as a homeowner have to understand what these are. And I'm going to, I'm going to rattle off some words here that um, you probably have never heard put in these terms. Um, there's eight of them that every contractor is going to present to you and you need to understand them and be able to, and, and be able to ask questions about them. The first is what we call the COG, the cost of good. Excuse me. I invite you to go back over to our contractor portal and look up the episode that John did on um, Profit 101 for contractors, where we talk about the cost of goods and how contractors mark that up. Uh, again, at House Masters here, we are encouraging everyone to learn as much as they can on both sides. So we're going to open that curtain up for you too. That'll explain to you what a cost of good is. The second thing that every contractor is going to ask you for is to is to compensate them for their labor and management time. And I'm not talking about labor to swing a hammer and put up a two by four. I'm talking about their time to actually manage your job. If you have a real professional contractor, they are going to charge you for their management time. 
If they don't, then they fall into a category. What do you call them, John? Chuck in a truck, Dan in a van? Um, Dan in his van Dan, and Chuck in his truck. Yes. Or Buck in his truck. Buck in his truck. Yes, that's a derogatory uh, description of, of non-professional contractors that we deal with every day who don't charge for the project management. Let me add, yeah, let me add to this. Um, Buck in his truck, Chuck in his truck, and Dan in his van are not going to know any of this stuff that you, that you and I are speaking of. So, in fact, half the time, you'd be lucky to even get a contract. It might get written on a napkin. With a, with a price or on the back of a business card, if you're lucky. But, you know, again, the, the purpose of home projects and, you know, our house masters episodes here are to bring the tide up and rise all boats. You know, we want to bring everybody in the construction industry to a specific professional level. And that's why we're speaking about this. So, you know, I just wanted to make sure that we were uh, differentiating between the actual two, between a you know, between a jack leg and, and a professional contractor. Correct. So cost of goods, labor project management time, the list continues. Burden. So burden is a value that contractors place in addition to their labor and their management time that covers intangibles like um, health insurance, um, various types of project insurance, um, any type of other incentives that they offer as an addition to their um, to their uh, hourly rate, and that's very payroll important. taxes, payroll workers' comp. Yeah, everything he just said. Um, it's very important that um, you understand that you're being charged burden because without burden, again, they're not making any money. They're not covering their costs, and the worst thing you could possibly have on a job site is a contractor who's losing money and not covering his costs. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, continuing the list, contingency. Contingency on everything. Every contractor is going to put contingency in it. The four contracts we're getting ready to talk about um, deal with contingency uh, in a different way, um, but it's there. Uh, as well as escalation, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Allowances, most likely your contract is going to have an your contract's going to have allowances in it. An allowance is simply an allocated amount of money for an unknown material. I'm going to use a kitchen renovation as an example. You sit down with the kitchen designer; they design this beautiful kitchen for you, and um, they say, "Well, how much do you want to spend on appliances?" And your head spins around. You're like, "Oh my God, appliances!" So you go off to Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards, wherever your appliance specialist is, and you start shopping for appliances. And you realize that Gen Air has 15 refrigerators you love. GE Profile has 30 slide-in ranges you can't live without. There's no way at this point in time for you to really define what you want to pay for a lot for those kitchen appliances. So chances are your contractor is going to say, I'm going to give you $20,000 to spend on whatever appliances you want. If you end up spending more than that, I will charge you more. If you don't spend all the allowance, I'll give it back to you. That's the way an allowance works, much, much like what you give your kids for doing chores. Which I think is where the phrase allowance came from. Continuing down the list, overhead and general conditions. So these are costs of the work that are indirect. We'll talk a little bit more about them uh, as we go down. Finally, markup and profit. They are two different things and your contractor should know how to use them. And if he can't explain to you the difference between markup and profit, sometimes called net profit and gross profit, um, then you probably need to show them the door because um, that means they're probably um, making it all up, uh, and you don't want them making it up. You need all of your all of your um, scope and your contracts to be pure, based on pure empirical data, not something they pulled out of thin air because they read about it on YouTube. Anything else, John? Before I move on? No, we're good, man. All right. So I'm going to talk about the difference between escalation and contingency. So escalation is a fee, a price, a, a cost that is used to cover the price, the changes in price that the contractor cannot um, prepare for, cannot plan for. And this has been a really big issue in COVID times with the cost of lumber going up, cost of shingles, siding, windows, pretty much everything that goes into a house 
has to have escalation. Now, it doesn't mean that um, escalation does not cost does not come into play when a, a vendor decides they want to raise the price on something, because your contractor should be able to anticipate those types of changes and include them in his estimate. This is about things that he has no control over, um, and it's also driven by a, something we call force majeure which is a f uh, French term meaning act of God. So COVID was considered a force majeure, an act of God. Um, natural disasters, um, pandemics, epidemics, all the demics out there are considered force, force majeure. And a good contractor will have this in his contract that if something happens that he has no control over that causes escalation, you are responsible for it as the homeowner. And then contingency. A lot of people get contingency and escalation mixed up. Contingency is a pot of money you set aside for unknown conditions, unforeseen conditions, um, things that the contractor couldn't prepare for because he was not aware of it. He did not know what he did not know. This comes into place a lot more often in renovations and additions when you're starting to break into walls, adding onto structures that are existing, and you just can't see stuff behind the wall. Contingency will come into place. Now, Every contractor should carry a contingency for you as part of their contract for contingency items that they need to cover. I also recommend homeowners have their own little contingency bucket over here on the side. Um, so if you've budgeted for a $40,000 project, the contractor is going to put $5,000 worth of contingency into there. You need to have another $5,000 sitting somewhere else. So essentially your, your budget's $45,000. Um, just so you are prepared for those unknown things. And I'll be completely honest with you because we don't do anything otherwise here. A lot of times contingency gets used when you make changes. Um, when you as a homeowner decide, oh, scope's changing, um, which drives the schedule and causes things to take longer. And that costs money. So that's where the contingency needs to come into. Before I mentioned the, um, the difference between overhead and general conditions. So this is, we're really getting into the weeds here. Um, most residential contractors are probably not going to differentiate between overhead and general conditions. This is gonna be applied more to larger projects or commercial projects, but you need to understand the difference between the two um, so that you can challenge them on it. If you see something in your in their invoice that doesn't look right, um, or they say something in a meeting that not quite right, you need to ask them, hey, is that overhead or is that general condition? Okay, so an overhead is an indirect cost of doing business. So it's the cost that the general contractor incurs that are not directly related to your project. They're not going to spend it on your kitchen cabinetry. It's things like rent, um, some types of insurance, uh, non-field staff, marketing, branding, all that types of stuff. Um, if the company is big and has some executive managers or, or people that come onto the job site to manage safety or, or uh, overall um, product quality, um, they are often considered overhead. They're non-job specific. They're not in the cost of goods. John, you want to clarify anything there? Did I get that right? Yeah, I do. Um, this right here uh, is where we get into a lot of conflict with homeowners. Um, and without trying to bash homeowners, um, again, we're coming mostly from the side of being a contractor, but we're, we're reaching out to the homeowner side for one because we are one too. We're trying to create a level of understanding on both sides or both parties. Um, homeowners have a large tendency when they're bidding a project to go for the cheapest price. And a lot of times the cheapest price ends up being a lot cheaper than what the project normally should be. Uh, we've all heard the, what we call a misnomer uh, here at home projects that you always should go out and get three bids. Yeah, I understand why people say that, but I don't necessarily agree with it. If you feel comfortable with a particular contractor on the first bid and it's within your budget, uh, by all means, go to contract with them. Um, when you have a situation where you have two professional contractors who have bid a particular project, say twenty and twenty-two thousand dollars, and the third contractor comes in at twelve five, 
somebody's messed up and it's not the two that came in within two thousand dollars of one another okay by you hiring that cheap contractor what we, what we tend to call buck and his truck and uh dan and his van um by you hiring that contractor you are adding to the malaise in the in the construction field that we're trying to get away from we're trying to bring a level of professionalism to the entire industry. And by you hiring that jackalag, it, it creates a sense of acceptance as if his model or lack thereof actually is acceptable to the industry. And it's not because what's going to end up happening is, is you're going to end up in court because for one, he didn't lay out all the details of what he was going to do. He certainly didn't lay out the details of what he wasn't going to do. He didn't lay out the details of the payment schedule. He didn't lay out the details as to what you were uh, going to buy or if what he was going to buy. He didn't lay details out on anything. All he did is he put a price down and he put he was going to put siding on the house or that he was going to put cabinets up. He didn't tell you what brand cabinets. He didn't tell you what type of knobs. He didn't tell you what um, what finish on the cabinets is going to be, be used. He didn't tell you any of that stuff. So those are the types of things that create an additional cost to the professional contractor. And then when you throw in overhead, as if Steve, as Steve was just mentioning, Buck and his truck has no overhead. They don't have workers' comp. They don't have general liability. They don't have an office where they're paying utilities and an office manager and all of those types of things. All of these particular overhead costs are actually a benefit to you as a homeowner. Not having those costs as overhead is a detriment to you as a homeowner. It adds a layer of protection to have a contractor that has those particular costs. Look at it as the additional cost that you pay a contractor as being an insurance policy to you getting what you want in the end. So, you know, I, the reason why I spoke up now is is overhead is usually a major um, distinguishing factor between Buck and his truck and a professional contractor. Uh, one has one, one has it, the other doesn't. And if you see a drastic change in price, uh, usually that is the actual culprit of why the, the difference is sitting there. Very well said. <clears throat> the other, the other cost that's often associated or, or confused with overhead is called general conditions. General conditions are not, are, are actually cost of goods, the COG I mentioned earlier, um, but they're not tangible pro products that show up on your job site. It's things like um, equipment rental, renting the Bobcat, renting the trailer that he used to get his lumber there. Um, if he owns the Bobcat, he may rent it to you as a cost of good through general conditions, perfectly legit. Again, it's all about professionalism because if he didn't own it, he was going to go to AAA rental and rent it probably at a premium. So by him renting it to you as an owned good, he's actually doing you a service. So that's just a little inside, but that's considered a general condition. Another idea, another element of general condition would be permits permit signs, job site trailer, um, other expenses related to site costs like erosion control and stormwater management, which is dictated by your local government and your local jurisdictions. Those black fences they put up all over the job site, that's called a, a sediment fence. That's to prevent um, the, the dirt from your job site from flowing into the, into the stormwater sewer and clogging up the pipes. That's required. That's a building code. They can't not do that. But that fabric isn't going to isn't going to be part of your job forever. They're going to rip it up and put it in a compost bin in about at the end of the job, and so that shows up in your general conditions because it's not a tangible product. It's going to be part of the house. If you're financing a home or a project like this, oftentimes your bank will ask for what are the general conditions. What is the what is the percentage of general of general conditions? What they often ask, and what that what they're asking is. They want to make sure that the general conditions aren't too big um, that because sometimes if a contractor is um, trying to pad his pocket 
unfairly with profit, they'll inflate the general conditions. And so that's why you need to know what general conditions are and how they're not overhead. So I could we could go into that with a lot more detail. If that's confusing, please comment and send us an email. All right. So before we dive into the prod, the contract types, I'm going to talk a little bit about delivery types. And I'm not talking about having your pizza delivered or the groceries delivered to your house. I'm talking about the process in which the project is performed. It's delivered to you. And there's basically three different types. For, we'll call it you know, three different types of project delivery for most residential projects. The first is probably the most common, design, bid, build, the three the, the trifecta. And this is where you hire the designer, whether it's an architect, interior designer, draftsman, doesn't really matter. You hire the designer. They put together bid documents, drawings, specifications, renderings, whatever, sketches. And then you take those bid drawings and you bid them out. As John said before, the common wisdom is to bid it out to three contractors. That's fine. But if you have a contractor in mind who you have a relationship with, you trust, may not need to go out to more than one, maybe two. If you get more than three, you're probably just wasting people's time, to be completely honest with you. But that's the design, bid, build process. That's the, the very common. The next version is actually a delivery project, a process I used a lot when I was an architect um, doing construction as a design, build contractor, and I just gave it away. It's a design, build, delivery. This is where the, contra the designer works for the contractor. And the GC helps you, the homeowner, through the design process. You actually hire them to help you do budgets, review the drawings for constructability, do material research. Um, oftentimes, contractors will have relationships with the vendors. So you can go out and you can, um, in advance of getting a bid or a price, you can talk to the person who's going to do the, the countertops. And they can help you pick out the uba tuba or the color of the granite or whether you want cultured marble or quartz because the contractor doesn't have those expertise but because they're part of the design build process they are going to help you figure this stuff out earlier than not so he can put together a good number for you it's a very valuable process now a lot of people shy away from it because it requires you to enter into a contract with a contractor before you have the, the final number. We'll talk about that as we get into some contract um, types. Then the final type of delivery is the construction manager at risk. And this is probably a little foreign to everybody who just heard that. It's very, it's much more common in the commercial world. But I'm trying to educate um, the residential um, world a little bit on it because there's a lot of value that the CM manager at risk can bring. In this particular case, the designer works for the owner, just like in the design build bid process. But in this particular case, the construction manager, which isn't a fancy word for contractor, also is working for you in the design process doing pre-construction services or what they call pre-con. So it's really a hybrid between the design bid build and the design build process. And we'll go into a whole lot more detail what that means when we start talking about contracts. All right. Just like there's three different delivery methods, there's a couple different ways to determine the contractor's fee. And this is really, really important as a homeowner for you to understand, because if you don't understand how they're making their profit, then they're going to find a way to take advantage of you because you don't know how they're making their profit. So in a design bid build um, delivery process, the contractor sets his fee and it's fixed. He may not share it with you. If you ask him for it, he probably won't give it to you. They probably won't give it to you. Now they might, and if you have a good relationship with them, they might share it with you. But in this particular case, they're gonna have a fixed fee and it's set. They're gonna give you one big number at the bottom of the page and that's gonna include everything and you have very little say in it. In a design build and the CM at risk delivery, the contractor may negotiate what that fee is. And in this particular case, I encourage homeowners to go out and find a contractor first. Um, before you've even talked to a designer, an architect and true designer, whoever, go out and find the contractor first. And one of your first questions should be, what's your fee? Not how much are you going to build this project for? Not how much does that two by four cost? How much are you going to charge me in fee? How much is your profit? 
And then you can start selecting your contractors based on their profit. And that's kind of like an early bid process. Um, you can talk to a whole bunch of different contractors and you're not wasting their time because they're not having to do estimates for you. They're simply negotiating with you based on your fee. Um, it's a very liberating process. I've, I've, I've done it dozens and dozens of times when I was a general contractor. Um, in that particular process, the general contractor will work with you in the design process at risk. So when I mentioned before the construction manager at risk, at risk is a fancy way of saying that they are working for free at the current moment with the promise or the anticipation of eventually getting paid once the project moves forward. Now, sometimes in their contract, they'll also ask for um, a contingency on that. So if, the, if they put in 100 hours into your project and the project doesn't happen, they'll ask to be reimbursed for their time, which is very fair, very a professional of you as a homeowner to compensate for them for their time. But they are very willing to do that work because what it allows them to do is to develop a relationship with you as the homeowner and you with them. It's like dating. Um, if you consider the construction itself being married, this process is the dating and the engagement process and allows you lots of avenues to get out, allows you to ask questions that are, that, that can't be misinterpreted. And they're doing the same thing with you. They're going to use this pre-construction, this, this, this at risk process to get to know you as well. And if you do things that set off their radar, their red flags, they also have an out. And so it's a real good way for both of you to kind of fill each other way out. This does not happen in the design build bid process or design bid build process because you're going to pick someone strictly on price. In the design build and the CM at risk process, you're picking someone based on your relationship with them and how much you are willing to pay them profit to do this project. John, anything you want to add there before I d jump into some more technical stuff? No, you're on the roll, man. All right. Sources of contracts. So the general, you have you invite the general contractor over to your house for a meeting, or maybe he has you come over to his office, and he lays a contract out for you in front in front of you and says, "Here's the pen, and you just sign right here." Or he sends it to you in DocuSign, and you sign it there as well. Where do you think he got those project that contract from? He didn't just pull it out of thin air. Many times, the contractors belong to networking groups. Um, where they rely on colleagues of theirs to help them negotiate through business type decisions. And oftentimes they'll get contracts from other contractors who have successful contracts. Very legit, very reasonable. And for you, that's probably not a bad solution because that means that contract's probably been vetted out and tested several times. And which means other homeowners, other clients have also been successful with those contracts. And I often um, invited clients. I was never offended when they asked me, hey, where did you get this contract from? Happy to explain where it came from. In many cases, contracts just developed over time with me. But in, many, in most cases, I got my contracts from um, the AIA.org website. So I'm a licensed architect um, as well as a general contractor. So I belong to the American Institute of Architects. It's just kind of a professional organization for licensed designers. And they have a, a program where they sell um, contracts. Uh, again, they um, are vetted by they're vetted by lawyers and attorneys, and in many cases have been um, challenged by the legal process, the judicial um, branch of the government, um, many times over. Um, and they have standard form contracts that your contractor can buy and then fill in information, kind of like a Mad Libs type situation, and, and then present it to you as a legal document. And I strongly recommend that. If a contractor comes to you and says, what kind of contract would you like to have? Blow their freaking mind and say, I want you to present me with an AIA contract. If they know what that is, that's probably the contractor for you. Side note. Um, obviously, the other way of getting contracts is hiring an attorney. Um, and regardless of where the contract comes from, you need to have your attorney review them as well. All contracts, all contracts, A-L-L, -L, capital all, are written to benefit the contractor. All of them. Even the AIA contract is written to benefit the contractor. And your best line of defense as a homeowner 
is to challenge them. Don't challenge too hard, because as we're going to go through a lot of these things, there's a lot of legitimate things in them, but you got to make sure that you are being protected when it comes to escalation, when it comes to contingency, when it comes to arbitration, mediation, or litigation, when it comes to pay fees and schedules. All the things in here have to work for you as well, because this is something you have to live with. But keep in mind, all contracts are written to benefit the contractor. And please, as a homeowner, do not offer to prov provide your contract. The first thing any legitimate contractor is going to do if a contract, if a owner provides their own contract is walk out the door because nothing ever good comes from a, con a homeowner who provides a contract for the contractor to sign. Cause guess what? That contract benefits only you. And very, very few times does it balanced enough to provide the contractor, the type of support he needs to do your project. So if I had, we any... also add something yes. to that, Steve. When you go to the doctor's office, you don't provide your own gauze. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't provide your own stethoscope. And, you know, and, and you know, this providing your own contract also lends into the buying of your own material uh, nonsense as well. That we'll get a little bit uh, further in detail on as we move along here. But, you know, um, one one way to um, to create an instant disconnect with a contractor is to provide your own contract because you are for one not hiring a contractor from a leverage point of any uh, from an expertise standpoint by any stretch of the imagination they as the contractor are the expert hence the reason why you're paying them they're not paying you so keep that in mind when you are forming a relationship or moving closer to a contract that that's a big no-no in this industry and it will be looked at as um you know right. <laughs> there's been a few uh, homeowners that pulled that one with me and all i did is an about face and walked out the door yep. and i can promise you that any contractor worth his own weight that you want to do business with is going to do the exact same they might be nice to you and excuse themselves, but they will walk out the door. All right. The so, results still the same. <laughs> still same. All right. So I have a handful of zingers here of one-liners that I'm going to go through before we get into the four different contracts I want to discuss. Number one, never ever do work with a contractor without a contract. Can't be any more simple than that. You must have one. Never do business on a handshake. Now you might hand shake their hand after the contract is signed, perfectly legit, but never ever do a verbal contract that is based on a handshake. Even if you record the conversation, have witnesses, do not do it. Excuse me. Never always get it in writing, which is the converse to never do it over a handshake. Email is not as reliable as you think. Neither is texting, neither is social media. Never agree to a contract over text. And the reason email is not as reliable as you think it is, is because it's very difficult to prove who actually sent the email. And I told you at the beginning that John and I were sharing this stuff with you because we've made these mistakes as both homeowners and contractors, and this is a big one. I've been sued, I was sued twice as a general contractor, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. And it was largely due to communication breakdowns when we relied on verbal communication, texting, and email. And in court, I went through arbitration on both of them. The emails were found to be not admissible because nobody could prove that they were actually sent by me or by my home, by my client. So do not rely on them. You can certainly rely on texts and emails to develop ideas and thoughts and communications like that. But the legal stuff needs to be uh, a wet signature on a piece of paper or DocuSign or something that has some type of a legal background to it. Um, this is going to sound weird, but you need to agree on the contract type with your contractor before they provide the estimate. That way they know how to generate the estimate. Because as you're going to find out here, and then when we talk about the four different types of contracts, the estimate um, is different in each type of contract. 
Um, never change or ask for the contractor to change the contract type in the middle of the job. Um, this doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. And sometimes what happens is the project um, has scope increases that, that, that maybe it, it's, you realize it's better to go from a, a bid job to a cost plus, or you come to them and say, hey, um, you're renovating my kitchen right now on a fixed number, fixed bid, but I want to add a garage. And I want you to do that cost plus. You're already on the job site. You already have all the materials and all your contract, all your, your subs are already here. Let's just do that one cost plus, you know? No. If you stick with one, pick one and stick with it. Um, and I think that's actually the last zinger I have before I get into the basic contract structures. John, let me clarify, Steve, yeah. um, to your last point there. That does not necessarily mean that you can't change your mind in terms of the scope of the project itself. Oh, no, of course not. We're speaking in terms of just the form of the contract. Okay, there's two distinct differences there. Yes. You got the contract form, which we don't want changed during the process, but then there are always going to be a situation in a long, drawn out, you know, remodeling project where there might be some decisions that change along along the way. Those are still permissible, um, but don't ever change the contract. That's correct. All right, so up on the screen is a chart, and you're going to see this four different times. Uh, at the top of the chart, it says conventional fixed bid. That's the type of project we're talking about. And then along the left side is a column with where I'm going to discuss what should be included in the project budget. How do you present? How is the contractor going to present you the prices? What the deliverables are? and the risks associated with the project. And then of course, everything in the column to the right is the information unique to this contract. So this is the conventional fixed bid. This is the one where you hire the contractor or hire the architect, the designer, whoever, they do all the drawings, you take the drawings and you go out for bid, two, three people. And then when the bids come back, you pick one. That's this process, that's the time time true time proven process that everyone thinks is the bee's knees in this particular process you're going to have the eight things that every contract um, should include cost of goods labor including management time and burden escalation overhead general conditions profit contingency and allowances and so one of the things to keep in mind as a homeowner is that although profit is a line item here, that's a net profit, almost any good contractor is going to have profit built into number two. For instance, their labor management. They may charge their site superintendent out at $90 an hour. Trust me, he's not bringing home $90 an hour. He's bringing home 25, 30, maybe $40 an hour. Some of the difference, the delta between that 40 and that 90 is going to be some overhead for him, um, some burden for him. Remember we talked about what burden was, but there's also profit built into that. That contractor is making money on him being there. Any good professional contractor is going to do this. Again, to put John's point earlier, if you want quality, you're going to pay for it. It's going to be part of a hiring a professional contractor. Um, contingency and allowances, we already chat, chatted about that. This list of things that are provided in every project is going to change on every contract. So how does the contractor present you the prices? Well, on a fixed bid, there's going to be two line items on that bid form. One is the cost of goods, the COG, which is items one through seven, all lumped into one pretty little package for you. One line item that you do not have to worry about. You know exactly what it's gonna cost. And if there's any allowances in that project, they'll show up on line item two. We already talked about what allowance is, so we won't go into that any further. The deliverables for this are gonna be full drawings and specifications. 
That means you have to hire a professional designer, whether it's an architect, interior designer, civil engineer, structural engineer, doesn't matter. They have to be able to produce full sets of drawings. As a contractor, I always winced when a, con when a homeowner handed me a set of drawings and they were incomplete. And when I say incomplete, you know, floor plan, elevations, probably some dimensions, probably, but nothing about what the finishes were, nothing about lighting, nothing about the quality of paint, nothing about, um, you know, the type of insulation you're putting in the attic. Those were all left to the creativity of the contractor. Well, there's no way that me and the other two, three or four contractors that homeowner was asking to bid on we're going to apply the same level of detail to the bid because we're having to assume what all that stuff is. So you end up with lots of allowances, lots of allowances. You've heard the phrase, I want an apples to apples comparison. When you get three numbers, as John mentioned before, the $20,000 job, the $22,000 job, and the 12,500. Well, one of the reasons that 12,500 bid was submitted was because all those unknown things in the drawing set he he applied ridiculously low allowances to to get the job he wanted his number to be low and the devil's in the details there's a lot probably a lot of if he had exclusions in his contract it was going to say that the allowances are this this and this the problem is you may choose that contractor because his number's low because Instead of putting $20,000 in for the appliances that you wanted, he put five. Where the other contractors probably put $20,000 in. You're not going to know that. You're not, unless you ask that question and look at the bottom line. So you have to be really, really careful about having drawings that don't have that detail in it. If you have lots of detail, there'll be very, very few allowances. If you tell them that, hey, I want this specific brand of, of hardwood flooring this width with this finish on it and it's nailed to the floor or it's screwed to the floor and there's an underlayment under it. Those are called specifications. Those are details that you have to go into with the drawing set. That gives the contractor a very narrow um, selection of materials he can plug into there and he, can, he knows exactly what that number should be. In a perfect world, the drawings and specifications should be so good that the only judgments the contractor is making is estimating the quantity of materials because very few very very few drawing sets are going to have quantity of materials. The architect's not going to tell you that you have 100 line, 150 linear feet of crown molding. The contractor's skills in the estimating process are going to have to determine that you have 150 feet, linear feet of crown molding before you can put an estimate together. So the drawings are very very important. Now risks in this particular project, this particular delivery the owner has very, very little risk. You're asking the contractor to take all the risk. They're going to hedge their bets against the risk by increasing their profit, their contingency as well. There might even be escalation in there because they know that if they missed something, if they guessed that a two by four was going to cost $3 and it ended up costing four, they can't go back to you for more money in a bid situation. They have to eat that dollar. It's going to come out of that contingency bucket, maybe the escalation bucket. So that's why you need to know the difference between escalation and contingency. But this this is where um, the, the, the homeowner can be taken advantage of if the contractor is coming in with a low bid and then the contractor realizes he's made a bunch of mistakes and you're now under contractor, under contract, you're half what they call half pregnant. You can't turn back now. So he starts hitting you with change orders for 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 um, for things he missed in the contract. So that twelve thousand five hundred dollar contractor is probably going to change order his way back up to that twenty two thousand dollar project because he has all these exclusions and the, the the poor delivery of the drawing set. And finally, banks love this. Um, if you're if you're if you're having your project financed through the bank. Uh, a second mortgage or using your house for leverage, they're going to love this because they have a contract in their hand that says it's not going to cost a dollar fifty more than this, and any changes to the scope of work, any increases to the contract, 
are going to be responsible of you uh, as of you, the homeowner, not the bank. Um, so that's where that little bucket of money over on the side may come in handy for your own contingency. John, I think I beat that to death. Yeah. Anything you want to say there before I move on to the next one? No, I'm good, man. All right. You awake over there? All right. Cost plus margin, also known as cost plus. Um, this is a very common um, contract type. Um, and homeowners like it. They think they like it, I guess I should say. As a homeowner... Um, you should be a little bit leery of the cost plus. Um, that's hard for me to say because contractors actually really, really like this delivery. This and the next one here, the cost plus fee. So in this particular contract, uh, the contractor is not going to provide you a line item for escalation, contingency, or allowances. That is because in the cost of goods, all of that's buried in there. And they are purely guesses. They are estimates. Sometimes a contractor will go out and get some numbers from his vendors, you know, the countertop vendor. He'll say, hey, man, I've got 150 square feet of, you know, grade two Uba Tuba. Um, what's that going to cost? And he'll say, oh, that's X dollars. Gives him a contract that says I'm going to sell it to you for X dollars. He's going to take that, that number and he's going to present it to you as an estimate or an allowance in the cost of goods. It's not going to be a firm number until he actually goes and buys that material, until he has a receipt for it. Um, and, and likewise, escalation uh, is not generally included in their numbers because the contractor is asking you as the homeowner to take responsibility for the cost of materials going up beyond his control. Um, and the contractor is generally not going to carry a contingency. He doesn't need to. Because everything he buys for this project, he's going to hand you a receipt for and you're going to pay for it. Just that simple. He doesn't have to worry about things going bump in the night. If, he, if unknown conditions um, show up, he pulls a drywall off the wall and there's mold behind the wall, not his problem. He's going to call a mold remediation expert and you're going to pay for it. Now, homeowners like this because, or, or perceived to like this, I guess, because you seem to think that by doing it cost plus, um, you're going to realize any savings that are not incurred in the project. So for instance, if you bid the project out and it was bid out at $1,000, and then you go and do cost plus at $1,000. When you bid the project out, the contractor is gonna write, is gonna send you an invoice for $1,000, you're gonna write a check for $1,000 and no questions asked. In the cost plus model, He's going to hand you an envelope full of receipts and they're going to add up to 9,950 bucks and you're going to write a check for 900, or nine, $9,950. So in that particular model, you saved $50 over the bid. Great. Congratulations. Do you know how much work as a homeowner you put in to determining that you saved $50? when all you could have done was simply trusted the contractor you already hired, the contractor that, that, that had the relationship with you and you trusted, and for all of this work that you put into it, you only made, you only saved $50. So obviously the risks are here that you as the owner assume risk for all costs. Nothing's firm. Everything's a, an educated guess. The contractor um, is also gonna be very leery of when you start saying things like, oh, you know what? I think we want to save a few dollars and um, we're going to buy the appliances ourselves. Because in their mind, if they buy the appliances themselves, they're not going to be charged your fee, your, your, your markup. So if your markup is, you agree to a markup of 25% and you go buy a $100 appliance or they go buy you a $100 appliance, they're going to charge you $125. But if you go and buy that appliance, in theory, you're going to save that $25, right? They're not going to charge you for it. You just removed it from their scope of work. You took money out of their baby's mouths, literally. What they're going to do in return is they're going to not warranty it, material and labor. They're going to remove it from the punch list. So they're not going to be responsible for you know, it not being put in 
entirely correct because it's not their equipment. And more than likely, they're going to remove all warranties from it uh, associated with the labor. So the, the plumber who comes to connect the water line to that refrigerator for the ice maker is not going to warranty his labor connecting it because the contractor didn't make any money on the purchase of that refrigerator. So you have to be very careful um, how you start negotiating post-contract with the contractor about what's in the scope of work. And so the contractor is going to be very leery of these discussions. Um, if they're smart, they're going to exclude that kind of stuff from the contract, or they're going to give you penalties or some type of a, a, um, a, a means that penalizes you for making decisions like that. Um, also, if you decide, wake up one morning and you decide that you need to save a couple dollars on this project and you're going to paint, um, you're going to say, yeah, we're going to save, we're going to save the cost of the painter. I'm painting it. You know, technically you're going to save that money and the markup on it, but, um, that's just going to send a, a signal to your general contractor that you are no longer concerned about them making money. And that's going to put you into an adversarial relationship with them. And they're going to start finding ways to make money in other places to make up for the money you just took out of their scope of work. John, anything else on that? No, I mean, you know, what you're covering right now is is the, part of the, what's the term I want to use without sounding too accusational. Um, this is where a lot of uh, contracts or remodeling projects go to die is decisions that are made. And I'm speaking obviously in terms right now, I, listen, homeowners, I understand some contractors out there that aren't worth their own weight, okay? But you have your own responsibilities in the, in the matter yourself. And these types of decisions that Steve is, is mentioning here, um, they don't go don't go well for a long-term relationship with the contractor that you've hired the contractor that you've hired to come into your home and better your home um i i would i would do my due diligence before um deciding that i was going to want to go down the, this road um the worst thing in the world that you want at the end of the project is the contractor feeling as if he did not profit at a fair level. Um, and, and you know, it, and I'll I'll reiterate that term: profit is fair. You know, and I said earlier to you, um, a fair profit uh, is a benefit to you because it guarantees you back end support from that contractor when something goes awry with a product or labor or anything else that happened on that project. You start doing these little things like Steve's talking about here and see what the, uh, what type of uh, incentive he's going to have to put you at the top of the line to get back out to, to cover his warranty to you. If there's even a warranty left and he hasn't, uh, gone ahead and struck that from the contract. So just keep those things in mind and, you know, um, it'll make it go a lot smoother for me. I can promise you. Yes. So the next form of contract we're going to talk about is kind of a happy medium here. It's, it allows the contractor to make money on the job and allows you, the homeowner, to have some of that latitude and and um, uh, creativity you want when it comes to purchasing your own materials or even self-performing some of your work. It doesn't make it right. Everything John just said is correct still, but this this form of contract gives your contractor a little bit more insurance so that he doesn't start having those evil thoughts and those, those thoughts about how he's going to try to make up for what he's losing. So this is a cost plus fee, not cost plus margin, cost plus fee. He is going to charge you a flat fee to perform the work. Fee for service. Um, uh, it's like uh, um, 
the, the, the fee he makes is not based on the materials he's purchasing for you. It's based on a predetermined rate. It's more or less based on his project management. So I'll get into this a little bit. Um, much like cost plus, he's going to provide cost of goods, labor and burden, overhead, general conditions, and profit. The profit in this particular case is, is he's going to call a fee. Notice in line number two, I struck out the word, the, the line, the, the, the phrase management time. In most cases, a cost plus fee, he's actually charging you for the time he's on the job managing your job, an hourly rate, an hourly fee. He's going to assume that Monday through Friday, he's going to be on your job site in some capacity for eight hours a day. His hourly rate is $130 an hour. And eight times 130 times five days a week is going to be his fee for that month. Now that $130 an hour is going to include things like overhead and general conditions associated with his time. The other overhead and general conditions on the project will be additional line items in the, in the proposal. The benefits of this is that you as the homeowner are simply buying his time, his expertise, and his professionalism to manage your project. And if you decide to go change the scope of work on him, he's not going to feel slighted. I keep saying he. They are not going to feel slighted that you've removed the $30,000 worth of appliances from the scope of work and he lost that profit because he didn't. He's still going to get paid to manage the installation of those appliances. Now one of the caveats to all this is the way the warranty works. Because he's not making a profit directly on materials, the warranty still may be excluded on things that you purchase yourself or work that you perform yourself. So just make sure you're comfortable with that. But at the same time, he's probably going to make less money on this project because his risk is gone, zero. The only risk he really has is managing your risk and that's what they do anyway so in this particular deliverable it's very similar to cost plus with where the, the the drawings are probably a little less detailed but in this particular case you as the homeowner are assuming almost all of the risk in return for having a lot more flexibility and in essence paying your contractor a lower fee for the same high quality project management um, contractors do like this because it reduces their risk. It also stabilizes their cash flow. And we haven't talked a whole lot about that yet, but what it does is he's going to invoice you at a regular interval for that fee, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, whatever it is, irregardless of how the rest of the project is going. So most contracts are going to be set up so that they get paid at milestones. That's either a percentage of completion or an inspection point. So if you're building a new house, they'll get paid after they've passed their foundation uh, excavation um, inspection. They'll get paid after they've passed their foundation inspection. They'll get paid after framing, after mechanical systems, after it's dried in, after the finishes are installed. Those are milestones in the project which they're gonna get paid at. And there can be lots of time between each one of those milestones based on the size of the project, which means they go a long time without getting paid. Now you're saying, well, they're invoicing me. I sent them a check for a million dollars. Yeah, but that's largely cost of goods, labor, overhead, general conditions. They're not gonna get their profit until those big milestone payments are made. But in this particular model, that inconsistency in fee and payment is eliminated. They're going to get a check whenever it is you've agreed to give it to them, and it's going to be the same every time. Um, when I was building uh, as a design build contractor, I was designing and building at the same time, and uh, I often relied on this process because I had clients who were paying me a design fee already um, to do the architectural design. And I just simply took that architectural design fee and continued it on a monthly basis straight through the construction. I was being hired for my time to manage their project, irregardless of the materials. Now, where this benefits you as the homeowner is you no longer have this guilt-ridden um, 
feeling that every time you write a check for material, you're also paying a profit on it. Now, we've said it before, profit's good, um, reasonable profit's good, but I understand that when you get an invoice for a $10,000 tub and it's been marked up to $11,000, that could be a sore spot because now you're paying $1,000 profit on this um, tub, uh, which is a fair profit, frankly, but it could sting a little bit. Um, so you're going to say to the contract, well, I'll just buy the tub myself to eliminate having to pay that $1,000. Now the contractor could care less whether you pay for it or he pays for it because he's going to get that fee every month for his time. Now, generally speaking in this process, in this particular case, it's actually okay for the homeowner to purchase the materials. Um, uh, as long as in the contract there's stipulations for, um, uh, you know, if, if things go wrong, if you order the wrong material or you, you guessed on the wrong um, quantity or, the, or you got poor quality or it was delivered rate late, all those things are going to impact the schedule and thus the um, total process, uh, cost of the project. But in this particular instance, if all those things are agreed to in advance and as a homeowner, you can manage that effectively, it might be a very beneficial, um, happy medium for you to purchase some of these materials directly and just rely on the contractor to manage the installation and um, in coordination with other trades. Um, so in terms of risks, um, again, most of it's on the owner. Contractors love this. Uh, banks are not crazy about this. Um, it's even worse than cost plus because they now know that the contractor is just simply drawing a paycheck uh, to manage the project. And in their mind, they see that as um, them being hands off or less involved in the project. I don't think that's fair. Um, in fact, I, I think it's very unfair how the banks interpret that, but it's something you might run into when you start dealing with your lenders. John, anything else before I move on? Nope, I'm good, man. All right. So last but not least, we're going to talk about a contract that probably no one here has heard about because it's primarily for commercial contractors. But I'm trying to educate the ethos out there because I think this is a project contract that could be very helpful in a residential application. And this is called a guaranteed maximum price. Um, and... Uh, like design build or um, you know cost plus, which are basically the same thing, um, as a contractor, they're working at risk with you. They're involved in the process from the very beginning through the entire process, and they're there to help the project be successful. Again, all all the all eight of the major elements are presented in in the in the budget um, and in great, great detail. The difference here between a guaranteed maximum price and a cost plus, the contractor is still putting a markup on all of the materials, but it's presented to you as a, as a profit line item in the budget, not a percentage of materials per se. They may use that to factor it, to, to calculate it, but they're going to present it as a, a, a line item. Um, and all of these numbers are going to be added together and they're going to create a guaranteed maximum price. In other words, if no change order, if you do not change your mind as a con as an owner on the scope, they guarantee the project will not cost more than that number. So in many ways, it's very much like a bid document set where they're going to guarantee the price. The caveat with guaranteed maximum price is they're guaranteed the maximum, not necessarily the minimum. So if during the process, the contractor is able to save money on a given material, that savings comes back to you as the homeowner. I'll say that again. If they find ways to save money, that savings will come back to you as a homeowner. Um, and that also helps eliminate um, a lot of risk on their end because uh, they during the bid process, which is essentially what this is, they would have gone out and gotten firm estimates from all their, their suppliers and their vendors. So they're going into a contract knowing what things cost, but through the process of it, they could find these savings. But 
as a homeowner, I challenge you to give them a little bit of a bone. Throw them a, 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 a incentive for finding ways to make the Chuck project cheaper by sharing that savings with them. So in a bid set, in a bid document, in our bid contract, if the, ho if the contractor is able to save money on construction, that money goes straight into his pocket as profit. He doesn't have to tell you it happened. You don't get to ask. It just happens. If he, if he estimates that a bag of concrete is going to cost him $8 and he buys it for 6 that 2 bucks goes into his pocket. In design build, or the, the cost plus version of this, um, you would actually realize any savings with the project. So again, if he goes in there, if he estimated or guessed that, that bag of concrete was going to be $8, and he only paid you, and the receipt he hands you is only 6 you're going to realize a $2 savings off of your budget. It really wasn't money you saved because you never spent it, but in theory, you're realizing a $2 savings. In this particular contract, in that, in that, in that particular um, uh, uh, example, that $2 could be split between you and the contractor. You take a dollar, he takes a dollar. Now, what does that do to the relationship between you and your contractor? All of a sudden, they're incentivized to go out and find better, cheaper ways to do things. They can't skimp on scope or, or quality because your drawings have already dictated what the quality should be. If you have specs, they're telling you what type of materials you have to use. They can't change those without getting permission from you. They can't substitute lesser quality materials to go save that money unless, of course, you approve it. But if they come to you and say, hey, you know, I had budgeted $10,000 for a load of concrete, but I got it for eight. Um, and their contract with you says that they get 25% of that savings. They're going to keep finding those savings because that's profit that goes back into their pocket. Um, in terms of risks, um, in turn, this actually shifts a lot of the responsibility back to the contractor because they have to manage the job for that guaranteed maximum price. They can't go over that number. Unless, of course, you change the scope. So like a bid process, the, the contractor is now assuming a lot of that risk. But it, they are also um, shedding some of that risk um, by being able to do things cheaper and quicker and being able to save a few dollars. Um, the key here is that the money in the project is always your money and the contractor you choose has to understand that that it's not their money it's always your money every last penny of it especially the profit they put in their pocket and if they don't understand that then this contract is not going to work banks actually like this particular delivery because it provides them with a guaranteed maximum price um, they can they can hang their hat on it and say this is what we're going to pay you for it um, and oftentimes, if, they, if the bank truly understands what this is, they'll also want to know what the shared savings were at the end of the project. So I find this to be kind of a, a happy medium between a full hard bid and cost plus. Um, I do a lot of these in my professional um, uh, project management and owner representative work that I do on a daily basis. Uh, man I'm managing lots and lots of projects with the GMP in place. And the contractors that we work with um, are very well versed in it and know how this works. So you have to have a contractor that knows what this is and isn't afraid of it. But it's a very, very um, valuable tool out there if it's something you as a homeowner are willing to, to investigate. John, anything else? I've kind of come to the end. Uh, the last slide here is a combination of all four of those contracts. And again, if, uh, if you're interested in seeing this as a PDF, as a cheat sheet, when you start negotiating with your contractor, let me know. I'm more than happy to send it to you. Um, it could be valuable if, if it's necessary. No, I have nothing other than the fact that I want to bring up um, to anybody viewing as a homeowner this episode. I defy you to find another uh, podcast series on home improvements that can give you a um, a non-jaded view from not only a contractor standpoint, but also a homeowner standpoint 
on the terms of a contract. I don't know of any anywhere on the net that you can find this type type of education. Um, again, you know, we've been on both sides of the table. We are we're contractors by trade, but we're also homeowners by nature, by virtue of a mortgage that we pay. And we hire contractors from time to time to do projects for us. Um, but the fact that you can actually get an education in terms of what to look for or to help you understand more where the contractor is coming from when he's providing you a contract option, I mean, that's a pretty big benefit as, as far as I'm concerned. And hopefully you um, you look at it as the same. Um, this is very valuable information and gives you some leverage uh, in terms of uh, negotiating your next uh, home project. Um, and hopefully you'll use it as that. Yes, I, I hope they do too. Um, I enjoy sharing this information and hope that as a homeowner you're receiving it um, hopefully you've learned something here. Uh, hopefully I haven't completely overwhelmed you with a lot of data. Again, I'm happy to share this with you. Um, if you've gotten some value out of this video, which I hope you have, again, please subscribe to our, our YouTube channel. Um, subscribe to our podcast if you're listening to it on a pod. Um, like it. Write us a review. Um, share share your comments and thoughts with it. You know, what about this do you disagree with? What do you agree with? What would you like to see more of? Um, and most importantly, share it. Um, hit the hit the share button. Share it to your socials. Um, give some commentary behind why you're sharing it. If it meant something to you, if you've gotten some value out of it, let the world know that we're here. John and I are here um, recording these videos for the only benefit is to impose wisdom that we have learned on you. Um, we are asking if you if you feel inclined to go to our website and donate to our cause. Um, uh, what we do uh, does have overhead. Uh, a couple things on that list are, are attributed to us here at, at Home Projects and House Masters. Um, so we're just trying to cover our cost computers we're sitting on and the headphones we're using. Um, but that's not necessary. It's not a requirement. We're certainly not going to, um, you know, require that to happen. But if, if you're so inclined, we'd appreciate it. But most importantly, share it with your family, your friends, and let the world know that we're here to help out and, um, and, and uh, enjoy it. So unless you have anything else, John, I think we'll exit stage right and see everybody on the flip side next episode. Thank you very much. Peace. Don't forget to like our video and subscribe. Leave a comment or question while you're at it. Your support is very important. Visit www.homeprojects.com to donate via PayPal or GoFundMe. Thank you.